So this morning what I wanted to talk about was uh, grabbing viewers' attention, sort of the importance of titles, abstracts, and specific aims. Now in order to understand the importance of all of this, I think it's a little critical to understand a little bit about the peer review process. Um, in order to understand how to write a grant, you have to understand to some extent who your audience is. Um, and so this is a little bit about the NIH peer review process. The peer review process for most granting organizations is very similar to this. Um, you know, essentially what you do is you send in your application, it goes to the Center for Scientific Review, and the key thing is that we're kind of concerned with is the, the integrated review group um, at the Center for Scientific Review or where the scientific review itself happens. There are later stages, so that's not the only review that takes place. Um, there's also um, a secondary review. So just to kind of review the, the timeline and what you can expect from most granting agencies, especially um, the NIH. The NIH might be the longest one. Uh, some of the, like I said last week, the private foundation societies, they tend to take less time. Um, the NIH is probably the longest. But phase one is going to be common to any granting agency. This is you, basically. This is your planning, the writing, and then the submitting. But what happens after you submit um, is sometimes a bit of a mystery for some people. So phase two, um, it goes to the NIH or whatever granting agency, and they typically verify that it conforms to their expectations. In other words, if you're told six pages, it's six pages, not seven pages. If you're told to have this pieces of information for the boilerplate, you have them all. And it used to be that they would actually measure uh, the, the font when everything was hard copy. They would literally take out a ruler, make sure everything, the spacing and so on, fit in the proper things. They don't do that anymore, um, but they do verify the fonts and so on. It then gets assigned to one of those NIH institutes that I talked about last week, and that's where a cover letter can be important. There's actually a form now where you can request which institute and actually which study section it goes to. Again, it's not always guaranteed that you're going to go to that SRG or scientific review group, but you do have the option of asking for it or, or saying that this is where it's going to go. The head of that group, the scientific review officer, is then going to assign applications to reviewers and readers. And I'm going to go through a little step in a few minutes a little bit more on that because that's where the titles, the abstracts, and so on get important. Phase three, then, is there's an initial level review. Um, that's where the, the members, your peers typically, will review and evaluate the application for scientific merit. They will assign priority scores, and a lot of agencies have adopted the NIH scoring system. From that review process, a summary statement is created, and then it's available to you. And most funding agencies will send you this summary statement. Every now and then there's some, like HRSA doesn't always send out the summary statements, but most of them do. It then goes to another review committee. And this is sort of a higher level review committee that takes all those scientific reviews from a variety of uh, panels, looks at the scores, but also looks at the relevance in terms of NIH mission and so on. And they are the ones that actually go and do the funding decisions. That first level of review, the scientific review, has nothing to do with funding. When we score applications at that level, we are not told what the funding line is, and we are told you are judging the science, not the fundability in a sense, um, which a lot of people don't understand and, and get pissed off at the reviewers because they're not getting funded. But it's actually at that second level of review where the funding decisions are made. If you're funded, then you go into pre-award. Uh, typically, you'll be notified in advance. You'll get something from the NIH called JIT, or Just in Time, where they will ask you for updated bio sketches, updated other support, and so on, so they can verify that there's no overlap in funding anywhere. You'll then get the notification of award, hopefully, and you'll begin. And typically, this is at a minimum about a nine to 10 month process from when you've submitted. Again, most good writing 
we went over that last week, it's going to take anywhere between three and nine months to write the grant in the first place. But this whole process from you submitting to actually getting the money or Emory getting the money is about a nine to ten month process. Um, that's assuming you get funded. If you get the reviews back and you're not within funding range, you can immediately at that point start thinking about your resubmission and then you kind of start all over again. Now some red tape that you got to understand for the reviewers. Um, there's two, thi two major things that they, they care about and conflict of interest is one of the major ones. And all of us as reviewers are informed about the conflict of interest po policy or the appearance of conflict of interest. And this comes into play, and this is again where the titles and stuff come into play, because before the reviews take place or before the assignments of the grants take place, the folks at the NIH, the, the SROs, the Scientific Review Officer, will send a list of all the applications for that panel and that session to the reviewers and say, here, tell me if you have any conflicts of interest and tell me which ones you're interested in reviewing. And sometimes it's just a check mark or sometimes like the DOD, the Department of Defense, will ask you, is your level of expertise high, medium, low, or none? And all of that is typically based on just the titles. The DOD sometimes provides the abstracts, but you're getting basically the title. Okay, so that, that think, keep that in mind. Um, what happens then if you do have a conflict of interest, and a conflict of interest is you're on the grant having a major professional role. In other words, it's, if you're on it or somebody from your institution, if you are the PI, it will not go to that study section that you're on. So if you're PI, so I, I was the chair of the BMITB, any grant that I wrote had to go to a, a separate panel. It would not go there. But if somebody else from Emory submits a grant and I'm on it, I simply have to leave the room. If anybody from Emory submits a grant, I have to leave the room. Okay? If there's a grant and Emory is a subcontract on that, I have to leave the room. So if in any way there's anything to do with your institution, the reviewer has to leave the room. Um, there's also a conflict of interest in the sense, and you can actually notify the, the SRO of this. If you're going through and looking at who's on the panel, because that information is public for nearly all the agencies, especially the federal agencies, you can go in ahead of time and look, oh gosh, these are the reviewers. Oh my God, there's Susie Smith. We hate each other. We're in competition. She always trashes me at meetings. I can call the SRO and say that person has a conflict of interest, please don't let her review. And the NIH should respect that. Okay? So there are different types of conflict of interest and on the reviewer side they're supposed to be honest enough to acknowledge that, but you also have the responsibility to go in and, and look at the panel and see and notify the SRO if you think there's a conflict of interest. Okay? Um, confidentiality means as a reviewer, I am not allowed to leave any discussions out of that room. Once I leave the review committee, my mouth is shut. Over dinner, shut. Do not ever ask if you know that somebody, one of your colleagues is on a review panel and your grant was in there, don't ever, ever ask them, hey, 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 how'd I do, how'd I do? That's against the law, basically, okay? You can't do that. Now, some people will do it, and some reviewers will tell you that is a breach of confidentiality. And just be aware that it can happen and that can get back and that person will never be on an NIH panel again and you're going to get in trouble too because you're the one that said what I get, what I get. Okay? So kind of keep that in mind. Most review processes at any, this is NIH, DOD, PCORI, everybody, societies, will almost always assign at least two reviewers okay because you always want two opinions a lot of times they'll do uh, have some discussants so three or four sometimes please note that places like the Department of Defense, PCORI and a lot of the major societies will include what they call consumer reviewers and these are non-scientists typically these are people who are advocates uh, for example, in the Army, when you go to a breast cancer review, you will have a breast cancer survivor or somebody from one of the major breast cancer societies on that panel, 
And they will typically not judge the science, they're typically judging the significance and the impact. Uh, that's true for PCORI, for DOD, like I said, the societies. Also be aware that the panels, for example, you're going to send most likely to NIBIB or NCI. In all likelihood, your grant is going to go to an imaging panel. What does that mean? That means that you've got folks who are familiar with medical imaging, mostly in radiology, but you're going to have PhDs and MDs. You're going to have engineers. You're going to have physicists. You're going to have radiologists, cardiologists, surgeons. You're going to have maybe me, a psychologist, uh, statisticians, a whole broad array of people. So when they say that this is peer review, this means, yes, you're being reviewed by people in probably medical imaging or at least in medicine, but they may know absolutely nothing about your field. And this is where grantsmanship comes into play. So don't make any assumptions that the people on the committee are A, going to know who the heck you are, B, going to really understand your topic. And that's why the context and as you write your abstract, your titles, and the whole body, keep that in mind. Don't use things like acronyms that are so unique to your little specialty. And always remember, somebody who's reading this is not you. So they're not going to have that all those little insights that you're going to have. Okay? Um, the two primary reviewers almost always have to write a complete review. The discussants uh, may or may not have to write. Sometimes they do, and it's just a short paragraph, their thoughts. But anybody who else has interest, because we all know which, what grants they are, some people are actually motivated to go and read other ones if they like your title or they say, hey, this is in my field. I'm going to go read this one. And they can write something up as well. Okay, So it doesn't have to be those that are assigned. The reviews are always done prior to the meeting. Uh, and this is assuming that there is a meeting. Sometimes some granting agencies, there, there are no meetings. I do a lot of international ones, and you simply send in your reviews, and that goes to a secondary committee that, that reviews them, but you're never part of the actual committee. But with the NIH, DOD, PCORI, everybody else, there is a review committee, and they do typically meet in person or online. Um, and uh, those are usually done by video like we're doing today, but with all, you can see everybody. Um, so you submit your reviews and you give a preliminary score. You cannot look at anybody else's reviews until yours is posted. Okay, and, and then after that you cannot change it until after the meeting. So basically you got to do the reviews. You can't just go and look and see what everybody else wrote and say, oh yeah, okay, I agree, I'm going to write the same thing. Okay, they, it used to be that way and then people said they figured it out and they said, no, you can't do that anymore. Prior to the meeting, Nearly every agency these days will triage, simply because there are just far too many grants to review, even in a two and a half day period. Um, almost always, it's at least 50% get triaged. And what that means is, you will get the reviews. They are all reviewed. What it means, however, is that they don't get discussed at the meeting. And you will not get a score, typically. Okay. Um, the top half will then get discussed at the meeting. Um, at the meeting, what happens is we'll go through that triage list and we'll make sure that all the people in the room are okay with not discussing it. If anybody in the room, even if they were not assigned as a reviewer, says, I want that one reviewed, it has to be reviewed. It may be a short review, <laughs> a real short review, but it will still get reviewed. Okay. Um, again, you still get all your written comments, and it doesn't mean, if you get a no score, it doesn't mean that the grant was awful. It just means that we simply don't have enough time to review every single grant. And unfortunately, you don't know when you get no scored, were you at the top of the no scored list or were you at the bottom? And so you really kind of have to look at the comments and, and kind of judge, uh, but almost always you know, unless they truly trash it and say this has been done or it's against the laws of physics, resubmitting is always a really good option. At the review committee, each grant is discussed, again, if it's made, made the top, less than 15 minutes per grant. We usually aim for about 10 to 12, okay, and that's fast, okay. 
So what happens is we'll typically go around to the reviewers. I'll say, what's your score? They'll give me a score. The other reviewer will give me a score, as will the discussants. The primary reviewer will then give a quick summary. This is where your abstracts are really important. And then they will give their comments, strengths and weaknesses. Then go over to reviewer number two. Do you have anything to add, pluses and minuses? They'll quickly go through their strengths. They don't have to summarize. Mr. Discussant, Mrs. Discussant, Dr. Discussant, whatever. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> it's then open to the floor for discussion. At this point, in terms of what's being discussed, it's the science and the grant only. We don't discuss animal or human concerns yet, and we don't discuss the budget. After we do this little discussion, we'll go back to the primary reviewers and say, okay, what's your score now? Did you change? Did you go up? Did you go down based on this discussion? Some people do, some people don't. Then we'll talk about animal and uh, human concerns, and then we'll talk about budget concerns. Animal and human concerns may impact the scientific score. If you're doing something that's going to harm, I can reduce my score, but budget does not impact the score. We can make comments and we can say, oh, cut year five, they're asking too much. Cut that postdoc, you don't need 12 postdocs, okay? 20,000 for travel, no, let's cut the budget to 5,000 for travel. None of that, however, will affect your score. Then everybody votes, typically based on the primary reviewer scores, and usually what people do is, for example, if primary number one gave a four, number two gave a two, and the, re and the discussant gave a three, most people take the average and give them a three, two, four. There's a range from two to four. If you go outside that range, as somebody else around the table, you have to raise your hand and say, I'm voting outside, just so everybody knows. And typically everybody will know why you're voting outside, because it came out of the discussion. The reviewers then have the opportunity to go back and revise their reviews within the next 24 to 48 hours. Because based on the discussion, they may say, oh gosh, I shouldn't have written that, that was really stupid. And they'll take it out. What are the criteria? Now, it varies by mechanism. And remember last week we talked about all the variety of grants, the K grants, the P grants, the R01s, the R21s, and so on. And if you follow this link, and I, I, I do, you know, I'm not going to go through all of this, but these are the various mechanisms. Um, these are the research mechanisms, so these are the R grants. Um, and this shows you what exactly is scorable versus not scorable and what the additional considerations are. And all of these are parts of the grant. And so as reviewers, we go and we look, boom, 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 significance, investigators, innovation, approach, environment. And when you're writing the grant, boom, 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 all these sections are there for you to write. So it's no mystery as to what you have to do. There's a, a form on this web page for the F grants and the K grants and the T grants. These are all the training grants. And then there's a last page for the shared instrumentation, uh, the U grants, and the, the P30s, and so on. So all of the criteria that they're going to assess your grants on are right there for you. And again, you know, just email me if you want the slides and so on. Now, the scoring, as I said, is supposed to be by your peers. It's supposed to be nice. And for the most part, I, you know, I've been doing reviewing since about 1994 consistently for many, many agencies. And I can tell you, I have rarely run into a reviewer who's just out to get you and who's mean. I mean, they, they are very rare. Um, we are really there to help you come back with good science. So the comments that are given are meant to be constructive, not destructive. And all the agencies really stress that. So, you know, hopefully you're not going to get you know, and if it is in your uh, review, the, it's the job of the SRO to take those poopy head comments out. Um, and they can go in and edit your, uh, your review. So if you are saying mean things, most good SROs will go in and remove those comments and say to the reviewer, no, you're not allowed to say that. This is the NIH scoring system, and a lot of agencies use something like this or very similar. The DODs is very similar to this as well. Um, and basically, you know, low is obviously not going to get funded. <laughs> uh, medium, at some agencies it might, it used to, you know, when I started, you could get a four or five, uh, the equivalent of a four or five and still get funded. 
Um, today, you really got to be in the one and two range to get funded, uh, especially at the NIH. This is what we as reviewers fill out. Okay, and again, this is online. It's, it's similar for all agencies. Um, we are going to write a statement about overall impact. Is this a significant grant? Is it going to have an impact on what? On the field, on public health. We then have to comment on significance, noting strengths and weaknesses, the investigators, how innovative is the proposal, the approach, that's your scientific methods and approach, and the environment. If you say you're going to do 7T imaging, does your institution have a 7T imager? Okay, if you're going to use some funky tracer that decays with a half-life of 20 minutes, do you have the availability of, you know, a cyclotron right, right on site, basically? If not, I have doubts that you're going to be able to do the work. So that's why environment is in there. There's a section on protection of human subjects, if you're going to do that. Inclusion of women, minorities, and children, that's part of human subjects. There's a vertebrate animal section biohazards, um, whether this is a resubmission or not, and that's, we comment, uh, you know, did you address the comments? I told you last time, do this, do this. When you wrote your resubmission, did you do it? Um, we don't have to worry about this, but applications from foreign institutions, select agents, absolutely nobody at NIH really knows what the heck this means. I have never filled that out, so I don't know what that means, and no, don't worry about it. Resource sharing plan, um, sometimes they say it's not required, but I almost always fill it in um, just because people are going to look for it a lot of times. Basically, at the end of this grant, do you have anything to share with anybody else? If it's simply going to be publications, say, we're going to publish all of our results. We're going to make our data sets available. We're going to make our images available. Things like that, you know, whatever you could possibly do. Yeah? I was thinking about when you, if you resubmit a grant that you submitted before. Yes. You know how you talk about that the company mm -hmm. actually you address um, So just like you do when you're submitting the paper, do you submit like in the yes. form? Yes. Yeah, you get you get one page. Okay. You get one page to address any comments. Any comments. And you, you simply go through, thank you, wonderful reviewers, for all those amazingly helpful comments. Um, yeah, and, and seriously, because I've had grants where I've reviewed, they come back. And I just remember one, and this is somebody, and I, I know her well. She came back and she said, I disagree with absolutely everything the reviewer said. I am not going to change anything in this grant. Wow. Well, gosh, what did we as reviewers do? We gave her even worse scores. You know, so, so don't be doing that. You know, respectfully disagree. You know, if, go and address the because most of the comments, like I said, are valid. I mean, when you think about it, most, you know, you'll go through, oh, gosh, yeah, yeah, I understand what they mean. There may be sometimes where the reviewers, based on the discussion, you'll get these disparate comments. Sometimes reviewers don't go back and revise, but you still have to address them. So you look and you say, what? Okay, respectfully, I disagree with reviewer number two when they said this was not going to work or that we didn't have preliminary data. We had, you know, go back and look at figure X. <clears throat> Plus we've added more preliminary data. You know, so anytime you're going to disagree, do so nicely. Okay, but yeah, you get one page, and then typically what most people will do, and what I highly recommend is when you do a revision, in the revision, somehow indicate what your revisions are. Whether it's by, blue, you can do colors now because everybody's using a PDF. So color, underline, italics, uh, lines on the side, something. Because as a reviewer, if I read it last time, I don't want to go back and read all that significance and all that other blah, blah, blah again. You know, I'll probably remember it. So just show me what you changed. Tell me and then show me so I can follow it. Okay. But yeah, you do get that one.